your service, Lord, that you help us to lift up our voices, to clear our minds, and, and just to be in your presence, Lord. We ask out that you just lay down your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help each and every one of us to, to serve you better, Lord, and forgive us where we have fallen short. We ask all this in your precious son's name. Amen. We'll begin this morning. We're going to, as you can see, we're a little different. <laughs> so we'll begin this morning by singing hymn number 10, How Great Thou Art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout displayed then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think, that God his Son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, 
my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, our next, I don't know if he said he couldn't find the word, so we'll sing Rock of Ages Cliff for Me. <clears throat> Rock of Ages Cliff for Me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. I know I messed that one up. You may be seated. <laughs> Our reading this morning will be from Hebrews. Give me just a moment, please. Brother Rick, can I borrow one of your Bibles? Oh, never mind, it loaded up. Sorry. You'd think I'd be used to doing all this by now. Hebrews 1, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophet. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through him also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having, much, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. 
For which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, You, your throne, O God, is forever and ever the scepter of uprightness in the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness and beyond your companions. And you, and you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will have no end. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are there not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask now that you bless the remainder of your service, Lord. We ask that it be pleasing to you. We ask that you lay your hand on Brother Rick, Lord, that you calm him and let him be your mouth, Lord, that he may minister to us and, and teach us your ways. And then we ask that same spirit, Lord, that you give it to us, Lord, and that we may hear it and take it into our hearts and therefore better serve you in everything we do. We ask all this in your precious son's name. Amen. The New City Catechism is question number three. How many persons are there in God? There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. For announcements this morning, uh, breakfast fellowship will be at 930 following the early service. The Sweet Tea Deacon's Wives Ministry will meet this evening at 7 there will be a recovery Bible study and accountability group meeting tomorrow evening, August 2nd at 7 p.m. At, yeah, 7 p.m. The Christian ethics class will meet Tuesday morning, August 3rd at 10 a.m. There will be a Young at Heart Wednesday, August 4th at 11 with a potluck meal at noon. There will be RAs, GAs, Mission Friends, SWAG, Youth, and Adult Bible Study Wednesday evening, August 4th at 7 on Friday night, August 6th at 7 p.m., we will ha be having family game night here at the church. Come bring your favorite game and snacks for a night of fun and fellowship for everyone. The Weststones Men's Ministry will meet Saturday morning, August 7th at 7 a.m. Um, our regular monthly business meeting will be next Sunday, August 8th, immediately following the 11 o'clock service. The Back to School Bash will be Sunday evening, August 8th, at the middle school from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, Walnut Grove has been asked to operate the grill and we need an estimate of 700 hot dogs. Someone else will be providing buns and condiments. If you plan to donate hot dogs, please bring them into the church by August 8th. We will also need help preparing and passing them out the evening of the event. Uh, the Associational Executive Board meeting will be at Cloverport Baptist Church on Monday evening, August 9th. At 7.30 p.m., Brother Barry Corder will be the guest speaker. Everyone is encouraged to attend. Uh, congratulations to Jerry and Olivia and Tristan Wade on the birth of their baby girl. Abigail Catherine Elaine was born on Tuesday, July 27th. The church has been asked to participate in Kids Fest at Lincoln Trail Christian Church on Sunday afternoon, August 15th. From four to six, they have asked us to provide folders, two pocket ones, uh, to give to the school children, and it is estimated that we will need 200. We will also need to set up some kind of table with a game for this event. Volunteers are needed. We are celebrating 205 years of service at our homecoming on 
Sunday, August 22nd. Uh, we will have a potluck meal. Please invite your family and friends. During the month of August, we will be co collecting school supplies, pens, pencils, and small notebooks for Operation Christmas Child. The food pantry is in need of the following items, and I'll let you read that, and donations appreciated from anyone who has surplus of fresh garden vegetables or eggs. All donations are greatly appreciated. Are there any other announcements? Uh, for birthdays, we have Allison Campbell and Keith Norton, and for anniversaries, we have Kevin and Alicia Keller. At this time, we will take up our offering. Uh, will you mind blessing the offering, please, Anthony? Y'all would like to come up for children's talk. <clears throat> We're doing that this morning. Flashlight this morning. Uh -oh. You know, when you go camping, you gotta have a flashlight where you can see what's going on in the dark corners back there. See back there behind that step. If I didn't have this flashlight, we wouldn't be able to see back there. If I didn't have this flashlight, I wouldn't be able to see what's in my bag, what's under the table. Flashlights are good, aren't they? They help us see what's under there, see what's in the dark, isn't it? You know, God is, we are like God's flashlights. God wants us to be a flashlight. Do you know that? It's not like a bulb like this. But God wants us to shine for him. He wants us to shine his glory out of us that he puts in us to the other people. And to tell others about God and about Jesus' love. So I think about the Bible. In the Bible, in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, it says... Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is, which is in heaven. So that's what God wants us to do, is to glorify him and to shine for him. Say a prayer this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for being here and all that's within your hands. Let me pray that you bless us and keep us safe. Thank you for the sin of Jesus who died on the cross for our sins. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. 
Good morning. If you would turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew 27. We're going to look at verses 27 to 31 this morning. Before we get there, we've got some other things to get to. Uh, one that's not in your announcements. Our, uh, our director of missions for our local association, is, uh, his daughter, Abby, has... Uh, well, she's experiencing cancer, and she's had surgeries, and she has treatment that's still upcoming. They're doing that in Vanderbilt, which requires a great deal of traveling. The reason I bring that up to you is, uh, as our director of missions, he's someone who we have a close relationship to, <clears throat> and uh, as, a, as a Christian brother, I want to try to take care of him if we're able. So you will see back there on the island in the kitchen um, an offering plate. Not the other one. I've got it removed from there, but there's another one there sitting there empty. We're taking up a special offering this week and next week. Um, that'll all be collected, given to Kelly. That'll go in with your normal tithe record, tithe and offering record. But if you want to put something in there, we're going we're gonna to give some money to, to Brett to help him with the travels and all the stuff because Vanderbilt is, of course, a pretty good distance away. And um, we're going to try to bless him in that way during this time of, of trial and, and tribulation for their family. So if you would like to give to that, that's the, the offering plate on the island, and uh, I'll leave that there through this service and then through the, uh, our, our donut fellowship following. Uh, so <clears throat> if you decide to wait till next week, I'm going to have it out here again. We're going to do it two weeks in a row, this week and next week, and we'll, uh, we seek to, to bless him, not just for the sake of his work, but because he's a brother in need, right? So let me, let me deal now with uh, that catechism question that Pat read to you, question number three, because there are some that when they, they make a charge against Christianity and say we're inconsistent, we're not. We believe in a trinity. The Bible teaches trinity. Now, when you, when you understand trinity, when I say that, that, that's a bit of a misnomer because understanding the trinity is simply beyond our grasp in its totality. But what we find out is that the Bible reports that God is one, and yet within the one there are three. That doesn't mean there are three gods. That's tritheism, and that's a heresy. That's not biblical. Neither is modalism, which makes it one God who pretends to be this, pretends to be that, pretends to be that, and it is absolutely destroyed by the baptism of Jesus, where you have the Father speaking, the Holy Spirit descending, and, the Holy, and, and Jesus rising from the water, all three present. And yet what the Bible teaches, in fact, let me read the answer, how many persons are there in God? When we do that, what we're talking about is a subject distinction. There are three persons, one God. There is only one God. We don't believe in three gods. We don't believe in one God pretending to be three, three different persons. Again, a different heresy. We believe in one God whose nature is distinctly different from yours and mine. He is one in substance, three in person, right? There are three persons in the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are the same in substance, equal in power and glory. In other words, all three possess divinity. All three are really one. Now, how that is exactly, you know, my experience is one. I understand me. I am me. I'm always me. I I, I don't have a split personality. God doesn't have a split personality. But his nature is different from yours and mine. What's reported to us in the Bible is there is one God from everlasting to everlasting. And within the Godhead, that's a word Paul gives us in the book of Romans, there are three. Three persons in one substance. We believe in one God and one God only. We are, we are we're a people, the Christian church is a, an organization, a, a, a group of people that believe in one God. 
That's it. Three persons. Now, I'm going to ask Matthew to put up the statement of Christology, which affirms the, uh, the Trinitarian position of the, of the scriptures. And again, if people who don't believe in the Trinity, they need to stop fooling themselves. Go ahead and call yourself something other than Christian. Trinity is, is taught in the Bible. You may not see the word, but it is plainly taught. Jesus makes a subject distinction in his prayers. He prays to the Father. He doesn't pray to himself. So it's quite simple, really. All right, the statement of Christology, and I'm going to ask that you would read it with me. We confess the mystery and wonder of God made flesh and rejoice in our great salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. With the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Son created all things, sustains all things, and makes all things new. Truly God, he became truly man, two natures in one person. He was born of the Virgin Mary and lived among us. Crucified, dead, and buried, he rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, and will come again in glory and judgment. For us he kept the law, atoned for sin, and satisfied God's wrath. He took our filthy rags and gave us his righteous robe. He is our prophet, priest, and king, building his church, interceding for us, and reigning over all things. Jesus Christ is Lord. We praise his holy name forever. Amen. And thank you for reading that. And the reason we read that, I, I explain it to you every week, and I do it purposely. The reason we read that is that statement is a, is a clear, concise statement as to the nature of Christ. If you have a problem with the Trinity, you should have more of a problem with the Incarnation. The fact that you and I don't understand everything is part of our creatureliness. God alone knows all things, and he knows them exactly as they are. The things you and I know, we know in part and not particularly well. In fact, we, we know just a very little, and the fact that we think that we know so much is, well, when you scale it over and against the omniscience of God, it is so very little. That, that's not an insult to us. That's part of our creatureliness, and that's part of his glory. We are like him, but not exactly like him. We have similarities to him, and he is not us, and we are not him. There is one God. We don't ascend to deity. It is unique to God and God alone. Well, I'm going to ask you now, if you would, please turn your Bibles to Matthew 27. We're going to see a passage of Scripture that you might find disturbing. And as I, as I read this passage, and as I see the harsh treatment of the Savior of the world, I look at it and I see people today thinking, well, I would never have done that. I don't think that's true. I think we all would have done this. If we had been in this position, knew the very little these men knew, we would have abused this Jewish man who seemed to be nothing to them. And yet he's the savior of the world. He's God incarnate. And yet I'm reminded that in our day, the violence done to Jesus is no less than the ones that we're going to look at. The violence done to his nature. That's why we read that Christological statement. The violence done to the person of God on a regular basis, where God is dismissed from all things, where God is, has his name slurred all the time. The violence done to Christ is still ongoing. So when you read this, it should pain you. If, if, you're, a, if you're a Christian this morning, you, you should hear these words, and there should be a little bit of a wince in your soul, and maybe even upon your face and in your body. Because this is the Lord of glory. This is God standing before his creatures, sustaining and holding them. And the whole time, they are abusing him. And he submits himself to it. You need to know that the purpose of this is he submits himself to it for your good. If he does not submit himself to this abuse and to the ultimate death that is headed his way, there is no salvation, no redemption no heaven for you or for me or for all, for all those that hold to their faith in Christ. So let's read these words. We're going to pray and then we're going to take a look at what they mean to us or should. So read with me, Matthew 27, 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the, the governor's headquarters and they gathered the whole battalion before him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, 
they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. It's a harsh account, isn't it? Let's bow our heads. Father, as we read these words, the violence done to an innocent man by thugs and murderers, by men of ill repute, soldiers. On the reading and proclamation of your word, made through the, the work of the Holy Spirit, this reading, this proclamation, go forth and accomplish exactly what you intend. We ask these things that Christ might be exalted in his most blessed name. Amen. I, I got a couple questions I want to pose to you, and I, I want you to just think about these as I say them. Are you disturbed by the treatment that Jesus receives in this passage? An innocent man. In fact, the only reason he's being, he's being scourged, and, and understand scourging. There are some of you that have seen the Mel Gibson movie that, that he did about the... Uh, the resurrection he did about the crucifixion, the, the Via de la Rosa, his suffering, which I think his whole life was filled with suffering. Imagine a man walking about that is altogether sinless, that at every moment is doing that which pleases his father, that is set down in the, in the middle of a vast majority of people who give no thought to their maker, to the one who is not only their maker, but their sustainer the one who feeds them every, every mouthful of food they've ever put in their mouth, every drink of water they've ever taken. Those are things God provides, and yet he is blasphemed regularly. He is denied. He is ignored. He, he is made less than nothing. So when we look at the violence done here, it, it should be disturbing to you. I hope it disturbs you. But be careful what you do with that provoking, that disturbing that you see, because this is not unique to the way people treat Jesus. Some of the most religious do the greatest damage. Now, in the end, they can't really harm Christ. But what they do is they, they besmirch his person. They try to say things about him that's not true. They make him only a man and not the God man. That's a violence done. And there, there are many who try to take the kingdom of heaven by means of violence. Matthew tells us that in an early, earlier chapter. And violent men take it. And I, I've told you that my understanding of that passage in Matthew 11 is the fact that there's a violence done to you that is your redemption, that is the new birth that God does, and that, and that he takes you from a person who is, who is happy to be on the throne of his life and removes you by mo removing you from the throne and placing Christ on it. But for the worldly man, he does a violence that we see in, in the psalmist. The psalmist says, why do the heathen rage? Why, why do the nations set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed? Because that's the norm. Ever since the sin of our father Adam, we have set before us men who do violence to God. Men who do violence to the Son of God. When you do violence to Jesus, you do violence to God. That's as plainly seen on the road to Damascus where the apostle Paul at the time, Saul, is going, that he having letters from authorities to go and to destroy Christians, kill, murder, and, and abuse them, drag them back to be judged by the world. So you can be religious and know nothing of God. These were religious men that had Jesus murdered for political purposes because though they thought they were spiritual, they were dead in their spirit, dead in sin and trespass, though extremely religious condemned everlastingly. And with their hands, according to the book of Acts, took the Lord of glory and crucified him. And yet by so doing, they were guilty and at the same time bringing about the desire of God that he would have his son crucified for the redemption of a people. That's what the church is, a called out people. Whether that be the Old Testament church and the word that's there in the Old Testament or whether that's the New Testament word both of those are the called out of God, called out by God to be the redeemed, right? Called out by God to, to, to be his people. But when we, when we do this, and this is always my fear with these computers, is they want to 
they want to leave you locked out of things when you, that's why I don't normally use notes in this way. Called out by God to a life that is marked out by our dedication to this Savior. The one that the world abuses is the one that we worship. The one that we look to for everything, they ignore. They take his opinion and they set aside, we don't believe that, why don't you? Well, I believe me. And people are forever trying to set him aside. The violence done today is no less than the violence that is done in this passage. They may not pluck his beard. They may not spit upon him. They may not put a, a robe of purple to mock him. They may not put a reed in his hand as though it were a staff meant for a king and abuse him in that way. But they, in fact, do far worse. Another question for you to ponder is what Jesus here endures truly worse than what he often endures today. Do you really think that this is worse than someone who says, well, I know that you believe there's a Jesus, but I don't even think he existed. And I've told you before, there's more proof for the existence of Christ than the fact that you exist. A great deal more. You're here, you, you can see me, I can see you. I, I, but we'll say, well, that doesn't prove that there's a Jesus. The only reason people want to doubt the existence of Jesus is because they don't want to be underneath Christ. They don't want to be under his teaching. They, they don't want to be underneath the gospel. And, and in fact, the New Testament says there are some who have not yet obeyed the gospel, holding out hope that they will one day obey the gospel. And there is only one gospel. That gospel is the gospel of God, which is also the gospel of Christ. Well, I, I have two points. The first one is, and I have under the title, offended or offense. And, and I, I, I almost didn't want to use that word because the world is offended today at everything. You know, that, and if anything is to be mocked, it ought to be the way that everybody is so easily offended today. They're offended by the fact that you do this or do that and, and things that... The offense they ought to take is at themselves for the mistreatment of the Lord of glory. And yet you and I should be offended not only by these men, these men who have plucked the beard of our Savior, spat upon him, struck him. Can you imagine balling up your fist and hitting God in the face? Could you imagine? And then looking at that hand spending your eternity in, in condemnation we call hell and going, I hit him in the face with this hand. If anybody deserves to be here, it's me. I spat upon him. I struck him with the reed that I pretended to be his staff. I, I covered him in a, in a cheap purple garment and mocked his kingship. He who is the Lord of all things, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Well, I think you should be offended. But I have a question involved there. I, I find that questions are very clarifying for me. And, and, and I have a couple of questions here. What, what should be your response to the abuse of the Savior? And, uh, and should you be offended? And again, I, I believe you should be. And again, the, the regular abuse of Christ is something you and I are going to encounter. You, you can't get around it. The abuse of Christ, whether that be by some who from their, their pulpits who know nothing of Christ, have not been born again, have, have, do not have the Spirit, take Christ and they malform him, malform him, misfigure him, distort him, make him something that is fitting to what they want. It, it's a reverse of Genesis, God making us in, in his image. They make God in their image because God is easier and more... more more palatable in that way when we do a reverse genesis. In fact, there is simply no way to live in this world as a, as a follower of Christ. That is, unless you hide yourself away, which is, uh, which is likely, if not absolutely, sinful. Unless you hide yourself away, there's no way not to encounter those who feel free to abuse the person of Christ. I, I, I'm just... When people carry on, they think, well, I think Christ is this. And they say something that is altogether not biblical, and they, they think it's okay. Well, for me, Jesus is, and then they name something that is nothing at all. It's that they think they can decide who Christ is. You don't get to decide who God is. God has decided who you are. 
And, and, and if we get wrong who the person of Christ is, we, we condemn ourselves by means of that. Because he has laid out before all mankind this gospel. And when, when men take and misfigure him, when they distort him, when they cause him to be simply nothing more than a friendly little man in, in Jerusalem, they have no understanding of him. They try to rob him of his glory. You, you and I have seen this, but just amongst ourselves. We see somebody who does some spectacular, glorious thing. Oh, well, but he... And we try to bring them lower, that there might be an equal between us. The Bible tells us, really, when it comes to things like that, we ought to be about the business of trying to outdo one another in giving honor for someone, not me. That, that, that's Hebrew, that's not Hebrew, that's Romans 12. You're to be constantly trying to outdo one another in getting honor for someone else. And, and not only do we do that poorly, but then we take the one who is due all honor, all glory, and we try to bring him down here. We're, well, now I'm not quite so uncomfortable. And you remember the, the encounter in the boat, and so many of us look at that and we, we misunderstand what it means. When Jesus stands up and there's a storm there, and he says, Peace, be still, and the waves drop, the wind stops. And the men in the boat, they go from fear to absolute terror. Who is this that stands up and winds and waves cease at his word? Well, this is God, and they know it. And they treat him mostly in accordance with that knowledge. How Judas could, could see that and betray him, I don't know. And yet it is in the human heart still to do such a thing. The fact that you're going to live your life as a follower of Christ means that you are set down in the, in the middle of a people who still think of Christ the same as these soldiers do. They think they can pluck his beard, spit upon him, mock him, betray him, treat him as though he were nothing. And they think there's nothing in that for them in the way of judgment. Do not misuse this Christ. He is God incarnate. Be careful how you treat him. Treat him with all the honor and the glory and the dignity that is due him. Let me, let me give you a, 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 some help. I, I believe 1 Samuel 17, David, is helpful to us. 1 Samuel 17 is, is the account of David and Goliath. Goliath is a big, tall bully with a, lot of, with a lot of weapons of warfare. And he stands up and he cries before the people of God, Send one of yours over. And if he kills me, we'll serve you, knowing that there is none there that can stand before him. Knowing that none will. And in that he mocks God, and he mocks the people of God. So many times we take this story in 1 Samuel 17, and we make it about David rising up. It's not about David rising up. It's about God avenging his name through a boy killing a giant. The boy killing the giant through the power of, of God, not through David's own power. He, he had some, some God-given skills that he used as a shepherd. But let's be real about it. This is a boy who kills a, a massive man, takes him down, kills him with his own sword in the end, strikes him in the head with a stone. He lays low. Then he takes Goliath's sword, which he could barely lift, and removes the head of this great sinner. See, the offense was not that he mocked Israel so much as he mocked the, the, the God of Israel. Let, let me read to you from 1 Samuel 17, beginning in verse 24. This is the account, and there, there's a line in particular in verse 26 we're going to take a look at. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, talking about Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. You know, we're afraid about a, a lot of things today, aren't we? You know, that's, that's been our condition. It's part, of, again, of our creatureliness. Perfect love drives out fear. When you and I believe God, we, we can trust God. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. Defying Israel is no big deal. Defying the will of God. And Israel asserting that these are his... Israel being set forth as the, as the people of God... That matters. Defying the church today is a serious matter. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. 
and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David had been sent by his father with some, some food to bring to his brothers. War was a little different then. We don't send boys with, with cheese and bread into the lines of fire today. But the, these men were, were there and his, his brothers were there. And, and his daddy sends, sends David there and David takes that food there. And then he rushes towards the front because he hears all the tumult. Verse 26 in 1 Samuel 17 says, And David said to the men who stood there, this, this is what I want you to hear. This is David showing you where his heart is and where I hope your heart is and my heart is. What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? Listen. And takes away the reproach from Israel. What reproach? That he would curse them by his gods and, and curse the God of Israel. That must be answered. What must be done to this one who does this? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Circumcision is the mark of covenant with God. You've got to know what that is. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? In other words, who is this man that thinks that he can defy God? You live in a world that defies the will of God continuously, calling good evil and evil good. And mocking God the whole time and saying, where is this God that you keep saying he's going to come back? He's going to come back. He's going to split open the eastern sky. Where is he? Mocking God and you at the same time. Understand they store up for themselves. Wrath. For which they have no answer. Except that they should come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way they can remove that. So that what you need to see there is that last little bit. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. So Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Every time you try to do something for Christ, understand, this is the way worldly men respond to you. There she goes. There he goes. There he goes, being being mightier than I, being holier than I. Oh, aren't they so amazing? Mocking the one who lives for Christ. It's just what they do. It's just part of the worldly conduction of their life. Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? You hear him? Mocking David. Mocking David's zeal for God. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. What I want you to see in that passage is here's a man whose heart is fixed upon God. He's a young man for sure. But he's a young man that sees the offense given to God and he wants to respond to it. What are you to do? Are you to pick up a sling and every time somebody used the Lord's name in vain, bang, rock to the head. You might do that inside your mind, never more. Christian people have been, been a people given not to nonviolence in, in our, our existence. We are to protect those that are under our protection, absolutely. But to be a violent man is to be unchristlike. If a man is given to violence, then he is either unconverted or he's really bad at, at, at being a, a follower of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that in the position of violence that you, you, you can't defend yourself. I, I, I've said before, I'm a pacifist for as long as you'll allow it. But the moment you won't, I go to a different place, praying God, God will sustain me and those that are under my protection because he's given them to be under my protection. And if I don't protect them, then I fail God, I fail them. And I fail everyone else. And I can't do that. David's offense is not about a personal insult, but the insult to God and his glory. When you answer people, you don't need to say these, these things like, like this. Well, I'm offended by that. They play that card. Let them have that. That's not our card. What you might say is, look, I don't mind that you offended me. But be careful how you offend God. Be careful what you do with his name. He says his name is holy, 
and that those that misuse it, when I say that, they just think that using it in that way where they say GD and they think that somehow that's the only offense. When you misuse him, treat him as though he were not weighty. That, that's the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed is the idea of it being heavy, weighty, significant. It, it matters. When people take God and they set him aside like he's just nothing to be bothered with. That's an enemy you surely don't want to turn your back on. And God is the enemy of all the unconverted. He's not the enemy in the sense that he's resentful and hateful the way men are. But as long as they remain in their sins, they remain outside God's grace. God offers a, a, a remedy to that. His name is Jesus, and it is the gospel. So let me ask you a question. When people are insulting to God by whatever means they happen to be doing it, how are you to respond? That's my second word, which is response. The first one was offense or offended, and the next word is response. How do you? Being a follower of Christ, because that's the way you should understand yourself first. Before you're anything else, if you're a, if you're a born-again person today, how do I, as a follower of Christ, respond to this abuse given my Savior? Because that's really what's, what's relevant here. The, 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 the text should harm you in the sense that, man, they struck Jesus in the face. They spit on him. You know how nasty that is to have somebody spit on you? I, I, I've read a report of a large black man that was spat upon. He wiped it off. <clears throat> he was spat upon by a child who didn't know that he'd spit upon the heavyweight champion of the world at that time. But he calmly wiped it away because he knew who he was. You're a follower of Christ. Know who you are. When the world spits on you, understand what Paul said. Paul says, look, they can't get to him, so they can get to us. Since they can't get to him, they will find you, and they will abuse you because they can't get to him, and their, their hatred of him is real. It is visceral. So what's your response? As the called out of God, how are we to respond to that which is obviously an offense to the perfections of a holy God. How do you respond? Because there's a wrong way to respond, brothers. It's a wrong way to respond, sisters. That, that response is to, is to act like they do. Well, I'm offended. I'm so tired of hearing how everybody's offended. Please, everybody, grow up, get, get out of the kindergarten, and move on with yourself. Yes, people are very offend, offensive. People are just naturally that way. They, they, they disagree with us often, and that's not necessarily such a bad thing. People can, should be able to safely agree with people who are adults. Only children say, well, you have to believe everything I believe. And they think that we do that. We're not saying that. What we're saying is, is the Bible says one thing, and disagreeing with God, that's different. You can disagree with me all day long. That doesn't matter at all. But when you disagree with the one who has all power and authority and knowledge, all understanding and perfectly so, when you disagree with him, you're never anything but wrong. So when they disagree with your position, if it's biblical, don't hold to a position that's not biblical and then say, well, you have to agree with me. They, they don't. I don't. No one does. But they cannot safely disagree with a holy God. Well, I have some points here. The first one is this. First, know that God can defend, can defend himself. I used to think that I had to defend God. And I remember hearing somebody make this point, and I thought, he's really right. So I've, I've been trying to do something for which God is completely capable of doing. God is altogether capable of defending himself. So first, know that God can defend himself. He really isn't looking for you or for me to defend him. Besides, we likely will not do it all that well. So there's the first thing. Second, you are to give, an, give a defense for your faith in Christ. I phrase it in exactly that way. That sentence is probably why I brought these notes up here. Normally I just leave a few notes tattered about in my, in, in my copy of the scriptures. But I wanted to get that sentence right. You are to give a, a defense for your faith in Christ. When the abuse of God is given, you must go directly to Jesus every single time, just as quick as you can get there. 
And then you got to make sure that you're being biblical in your response. 1 Peter 3, verses 13 through 17 are helpful for us here. That was 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? That's a question, but it's, it's posed in a way where you know that your faith in Christ will bring about some problems. Jesus says in this world you will have some tribulation. And a lot of that is going to happen because you're a follower of Christ. And the world hates Christ. They despise God and, and they will despise you as well. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. That's the first thing. This advice by the Apostle Peter is amazing. Despite the fact that you're put in a world where people feel safe to pluck the beard of your Savior, to spit on him, to mock him, to put a robe of purple on him and go, oh, aren't you the king, buddy? This is God you're treating this way. Oh, I don't believe in God. You, you poor people that believe like that, aren't you so simple? But, uh, you know, I, I actually encountered a family member that was talking in this way. I got quiet because I didn't want to respond in anger, and I knew that if I responded immediately, it was going to be bad. I turned to him finally and said, you know, I'm glad that God has people here as smart as you so that morons like myself can have guidance from someone so, so knowledgeable. And he, he heard all the sarcasm in that. And he goes, he asked me, is that why you've been so quiet? I said, it was either that or be really offensive to you, and I'm trying not to do that. That was a brother of mine. He since then began to take his faith seriously. I don't think it was that response. I think it was God working on him for years. A man who's been showed a great deal of grace and was, was working outside of it, living outside of that grace. Have no fear of them nor be troubled. It's the world you live in. Don't let it eat you up. Don't let it wear you down. God's love is greater than all the offense that will be given. But in your hearts, this is the advice of the apostle again, but in your hearts, honor Christ. That's where it has to start. It has to start your heart and in your mind. Honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. When people say crazy things about, about our Savior, when they say crazy things about people of faith, don't be offended for your own sake. Be offended for Christ's sake. And respond in a way that is a defense of Christ. This is who he is. That's who he is. You can, you can accept it. You can deny it. But in the end, you're going to have to answer. What have you done with my son? Have you bowed before him? According to Philippians 2, you can either do it in this life or on your way out to an everlasting condemnation where there is nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth and outer darkness. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet to do it in gentleness and respect. Now that's the hard part. You live in a world that no longer understands respect. They, they're afraid that if they respect someone not themselves, that somehow they've diminished themselves. We're seeing the passing away of things that were common in m many of us in our day. The, the idea of saying yes, sir, and no, sir is painful to them because they're afraid. Ooh, that might mean that I'm showing you honor. And I'm showing you respect. I can't, I can't do that because I'm saving that for myself. Says every child every person incapable of understanding who they are and has no understanding of God. We're to be able to be, to be gentle and, and to show honor to other people. If you can't show honor to other people, it really does mean that you're a midget. When I say midget, I mean morally, I mean intellectually, and I mean spiritually. I don't care how tall you are. I don't care about your height or, or, or whether you're anything like that. I, what I'm talking about is mentally, spiritually, you are diminished. If you're simply incapable of showing honor to, to people that are due honor, you're just a midget of sorts. So we're to do it in gentleness and, and respect. Having a good conscience. How do you get a good conscience? By conversion. 
by washing your, your conscience through the regenerating power of God's word, through the power of his spirit in dwelling. And that only happens by means of faith. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, when the lies about you aren't true, some of them about us are, some of the things said about you are true. To that you can read, to those things that are said true that aren't necessarily the things that shine about us, you can answer and say, and God's grace is so good, he still loves me. And for those things that are said about you that aren't true, don't worry about defending yourself. When, when you're slandered, because look at what it says, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, it assumes that it's going to happen. When you are slandered, those who revile you, the slandering that takes place, your good behavior in Christ may put to shame. You put them to shame by the way that you live, by the goodness that you display. That goodness being the Holy Spirit working in you and working out of you this goodness. It's, the, it, it's by the Holy Spirit that you and I have ever do anything good. And so when you live in this world in a way that displays the Holy Spirit, you put them to shame amongst men and, and before God. And listen to this. Because this is the hardest verse in this for me, to, for me to take on. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that is God's will, than for doing evil. What this means for me, when somebody responds ridiculously, and my mind goes to, you know, I can render you unconscious just like that. And I'm really thinking about it. But Jesus says, don't do that. So you can't do that, right? I mean, you can't respond with violence. You can't respond in a way, despite the fact that they say terrible, despicable, lying things about you, you understand the love of Christ for you is greater than any slur that is said about you. Then in any, any time they try to diminish who you are in Christ, understand the attack. Jesus says, look, they hate you because they hate me. Take that and it's okay because the opinion of a fool means nothing but the opinion of the almighty all-knowing God now that's something and when he looks at you in Christ he says you are his beloved and that he sees no defect because he sees you by means of the perfection of his son I would rather hear that my father loves me than worry about what all men have to say about me Paul helps us out here too, and I need to pick up the pace. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. And, and this is, when you read these, you, what you've got to remember is our weapons of warfare are different. In other words, that thing I just said a minute ago, you can't, when people say terrible things about you, the response cannot be, brothers and sisters, it can't be, I'm going to harm you physically. It can't be, I'm going to attack you. I, I, I'm going to do you harm. I'm going to do evil to you. It can't be. Because the people of God have been taking this, this form of abuse for many years. There's this great cloud of witnesses, we're told in the scriptures, of brothers and sisters who were tied to stakes and burned for their faith in Christ. And you have not yet suffered unto death. So you may be appointed to suffering. And some of that at the hands of people who say terrible things about you. If they're lies, what weight does that carry? If it's true, maybe there's something to be altered. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, says, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. This is the apostle speaking with all the authority of, of apostle. He says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. In other words, in his letters. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness in such, with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh, according to the sinful nature. So he's saying sometimes I have to be bold. Now understand what boldness in the, in the biblical category means. It does not mean this face that I have seen on so many. They think that being rude for Jesus is the way to, to win something. You may win an argument and, and, and lose everything. 
Winning arguments is altogether worthless. Telling someone the truth about Christ. Properly witnessing for Christ. Suffering abuse for the sake of his name. Those are good things. That's okay. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, in this world, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We don't, we don't wage war the same way. There is a war going on. Be plain about that. Understand that. There's a war going on. And this world is warring against you constantly. How many times have you turned on that boob tube, gone to your computer, and it's trying to tell you what you're supposed to believe? And that's in absolute contrast to the word of God. If they disagree with God, they're wrong. That's it. You can't, as a follower of Christ, disagree with Christ. When they tell you you have to deny the things that Christ teaches, they're telling you to deny Christ, and you can't do it. As a faithful follower of Christ, I can't do it. Verse 4 in, in 2 Corinthians 10 says this, For the weapons of our warfare, meaning we are making war in one way or another, are not of the flesh. They're not these. Right? It's not that nastiness that, that James speaks of, this tongue, this little bitty thing that flops about between your teeth, all the trouble it causes. Some of us might need to occasionally, you know, instead of sticking our tongue out, it'd stick it out far enough so you could put your teeth tightly down upon it. Because there are times where saying nothing is the right and proper response. Having a good name is something you and I are to endeavor to have. Feeling that I have to defend it against every knothead that says something about me is something, thank God, he's delivered me from. People have said terrible things about me for years. And, and you as a follower of Christ are going to encounter the exact same abuse. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divine. They're from God. Are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. In other words, what we do is instead of going at the attack, is, is we, we bring to bear, and that's why we have this reading program here to get you through the Bible every single year. Breaks it up into nice little bits. And as you do that, what you're doing is arming your mind for a, for a response to the things the world says. And you're not, shooting, you're not shooting shots across the wall. You're eroding the foundation of all that they have. And instead, it's, it's a bit of a Jericho where the walls just fall out and there's nothing left. You can't defend yourself against the Holy God. You can't defend yourself against a, a saint of God who knows the word of God. That's why you're to know it, to give an answer for the hope that resides within you. We destroy arguments. It means arguments in the real way, not the childish way that people do it now. Well, I, I can yell louder than you. I lose interest and will soon walk away from that. When someone wants to say one phrase over and over and over and over and over and they just keep getting it louder and louder and louder, you can count on at some point they're going to see my back as I walk away. I am so done. If you can't be an adult, we can't have a conversation, I'm just going to leave. Because I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop down into the worldly way, the fleshy way of handling, handling that. This means an argument where you can exchange ideas like full-grown people. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. These people that say, well, I have a PhD in the studies of something that never happened. You know, the, the idea of evolutionary biology. I believe in evolution in the sense that things change. They don't change into other things. Cats make cats, dogs make dogs, dogs don't make giraffes or hippos, right? They don't. You, you get two dogs together, you're going to end up with a dog every single time. I'm pretty sure. When I say pretty sure, I mean 100%. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. This is God's knowledge. What it means is the, the biblical knowledge, the, the word of God. And take away and, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The aim of what you're doing is not to win the argument, but to get them to Christ. You want to get them to Christ because that's their redemption, that's their salvation. And if they don't get there, they may be a better rhetorician than you. They may be more, more prepared to do logic than you, but they don't have Christ. And you want to get them there because apart from Christ, there is nothing left but condemnation for everything they've ever done. 
being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. This has to do with our perspective. In other words, let me, for time's sake, rush. What Paul here is saying is argue in a godly way, in a way that acknowledges Christ as supreme, that acknowledges that, that what your job is is to reveal Christ to the world. Conclusion here is, the behavior of these men is altogether shameful and wicked, both in that day and in this. But we must be clear. The actions of men, given that they are, as a group, are sinners, means that we have all done that which is an offense to a holy God. Even worse, we are without remedy to this condition. We cannot remove the record of our sins. So the conclusion is this. You see the abuse of Christ. You know it to be ongoing. What do you do? You live so near to God, so near to Christ, so filled with his word, that when they lie, when they, when they say things they know aren't true about you and about your Savior, you respond with the word of God because it's the sword of God. And it penetrates deeper than any of your other arguments can, says Hebrews 4.12. With that, I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Father, help your servants. You have put us in a world. And it's your world. Absolutely your world. You have put us in a world that denies Christ. Denies who he is. When we see this, this account of these men, what we see is a world that responds this way to a man who is holy. To a man who is so different that he is offensive to them in their sin. Help your saints that we would be holy. Help your saints that we would be those so filled with the Spirit and the Word that when we respond, we respond as Christ-like as we are able. 